It's an idea, it's reality. And God wants that reality for every one of us. Turn to John chapter 8, if you would please. We're continuing our study of the Gospel of John. And we find in our text a familiar passage of Scripture, familiar account to many people. And it's a, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to read. And I trust we'll be blessed by considering what the Word of God has for us this morning. John chapter 8, we'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they had continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This is a wonderful passage of scripture. It's encouraging, it's comforting, and I trust that it has this effect on us. It tells us some important things about ourselves, about sin, and it tells us some important things about God himself. And we, we, we know when we talk about ourselves and our priorities, our affections, we know that the things that are most dear to us are said to be the things that are in our heart. This is this uh, issue, this, this person, this cause, whatever it is, this is near and dear to my heart. It's, it's something in the center of my being. I, I hold to it. I, I love it. This is important to me. We know this is how we describe it. And God has things that are near to his heart as well. And we see what those things are by observing what he does and what he says. And in our case this morning for our text, we see those things that are near and dear to his heart by what the Son of God does and says. And so this morning from this passage, I would like us to see the heart of God, the heart of God as this passage reveals it. Let's pray and then we'll consider it. Lord, we thank you for showing us your heart, showing us what you love, showing us what you think, what you know is important. Because so often we love other things and we think other things are important and we get things out of order and we get distracted and we fixate on the wrong things. And so we praise you for showing us what is truly important. I pray that you would help us to change and align ourselves with what is truly important pray that you'd work in our hearts now from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This account that we've read has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. And I think many people perhaps, maybe some here today, uh, misunderstand and misinterpret this passage. In, in that misunderstanding, it twists Christ's words and it makes him say things that he did not say. It makes him mean things that he did not mean. It undermines other passages of scripture. And so we need to be careful to not twist and misinterpret what this is saying. And here are some examples, a couple of examples of things people believe that this passage teaches, but it does not teach these things. First of all, some believe that this passage teaches us that sinners are wrong to identify sin in others. 
If you look at somebody else's life and you say, that's sin, that's wrong, you're wrong to do that. You shouldn't do that. Because, and the reason that they, that they believe this is because in verse 7, John 8, verse 7, it says, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Oh, you think you're so righteous? If you're going to, to condemn her for her sin, you need to remember that you're a sinner, and so you shouldn't even be talking about her sin. That's how some people take this. And they, they use another passage of Scripture that we find in Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. That's not what Jesus is saying. To, he's not saying you are wrong if you identify sin in other people. You think you're so good and you're lifting yourself up as righteous by pointing in someone else's life and saying that's sin, that's wrong, that's what the Bible condemns. You're, you should never do that. And people use this to say, oh, you, you know, you're criticizing me, you're saying I'm wrong for doing such and such. The Bible says you're not supposed to do that. Judge not that ye be not judged. Jesus later tells us to judge righteous judgment. And we're going to look at what Christ is actually saying in John chapter 8. But he is not telling us to refuse to identify sin in somebody else's life. Another thing that people use or, or take out of this passage is the idea that God accepts us just as we are. You know, I am a sinner, and I've got my warts and my problems and my, my, my baggage, and God just says, oh, I just accept you just the way you are. You know, this woman was taken in adultery. She's fine. And you know, you religious Pharisees, you're being judgmental. I'm going to, I'll just accept you just the way you are. The Pharisees, you know, they were hateful and old-fashioned and judgmental. They were the ones here wrong. But, but Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Just, just stop doing it and, you know, you'll be fine. That's not the attitude that Jesus had. I will, I will explain this more in a few minutes. But people can use this wrong belief about this passage to condemn anyone who decries sin, who condemns sin. Anyone who says, sin is wrong, and if you commit this sin, you are wrong. If you commit sin that the Bible says is sin, you are wrong to commit sin. Anybody who says that message, people use a passage like this and say, well, that person's wrong. You can't condemn that sin. You, you can't be that way. You can't be judgmental. Even the Lord didn't condemn this woman who was in adultery, so how can you condemn people who are in sin? God does not just accept us just the way we are. And I will explain that more, what I mean exactly by that. But God does not have that attitude towards sin. Instead, this passage of Scripture is in perfect harmony with the rest of Scripture. Jesus acts in complete agreement with his character, with God the Father, with the Word of God. Everything that he does here in these verses is completely consistent with who he is as God. And in fact, it, his actions and his words reiterate what the Bible teaches it, throughout its, the rest of its uh, writings, and it underscores the rest of truth. It confirms the ministry of Christ and the, <coughs> excuse me, and the work, of God, work of God the Father. It shows us the heart of God. Christ in his words and his deeds is revealing to us God's heart. And I want us to see how this is true. I want us to see how the heart of God is revealed in what Jesus did and said in this passage. Some wonderful truths here. First of all, I want us to see that Christ loves us first. He loves us first. Look back at John 8, verses 1 and 2 again. <clears throat> it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Seems pretty straightforward. 1 John 4.19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Christ loved us first, before we loved him. And this verse 
is a reminder to me of this. Verse, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And you might say, well, what are you talking about? We see that he went into the Mount of Olives a lot. Well, we know that the chapter divisions are not inspired scripture. They were put in later, and they're effective because they help us turn to a place in the Bible and know where we're supposed to be reading. But look at the end of, verse, of chapter 7. We see a discussion among the Pharisees. They're having a conversation. It says in verse 52, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. The very next verse, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Every man went to his house. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again. Luke 21 Verse 37 and 38 says, And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. <coughs> hear him. <coughs> Christ spent the night on the Mount of Olives. He was camping out there because he didn't have a house. And he says in Matthew 8, 20, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He's demonstrating his love to us here by his, his commitment. He, he was sleeping under the stars, and I imagine his apostles following after him, and they found a place under a tree or found a place under a, under a grassy knoll or something to sleep on the Mount of Olives. They get up, and, and you know, if you've ever camped, you know what this is like. I've never... Um, I have camped outside without being in a tent but I've never just gone out just with the clothes on my back and found a place on the ground and slept overnight I bring gear and a sleeping bag and a, all these things to shelter us I doubt he he did that I don't think he had a big pack to carry around and I think he just probably slept on the ground and and we like our our morning ablutions right we like to go into the bathroom and and comb our hair and wash our face and trim our trim our, our hair and, and our beard or whatever, right, men? Uh, not talking to the ladies on that one. But we like to take care of ourselves, and we like to look good for the day so that we can be presentable in public. Jesus slept on the ground and early in the morning went back to the temple. He did this because he loves us. He gave up the human comforts that you and I often take for granted. He came back and then taught again the very next day. And we spent a lot of time in John chapter 7 looking at how the people of J Jerusalem were rejecting him. So I just want to set the stage for this time in the temple. He had just spent the night on the Mount of Olives. He was probably sore from laying on the ground, probably didn't sleep real well, probably a bit bedraggled from the dew, and didn't get a shower that day, and probably didn't get much breakfast, and he's coming right back to the very place that yesterday people were trying to arrest him because they were rejecting his message and criticizing him. And he did all of this because he loves you and me, people like you and me, first, before we loved him. This is the heart of God. I'm so glad that the Lord continued to come to me and draw me to him even after I rejected him. I was saved when I was nine years old, but I didn't get saved the first time I heard the gospel and understood it. To my shame, I rejected it, and I refused, and I pushed him away, and I resisted. And I'm so thankful that God kept coming back to me. Christ kept working in my heart. And I probably every one of us here who are saved could give a similar testimony that you didn't receive it either the first time. You resisted. You pushed away. You, you maybe hated God, and God loved you first. I'm so thankful that Christ loves us first. This is the kind of God he is. Look at Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 6. The love of God, we, we can't understand it. I don't understand it. It's not fair. It's not fair that the sinless Son of God should die for me. That's not fair. But it's what he did. Romans 5, verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died 
for the ungodly. That's not fair. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, maybe, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And what an amazing demonstration of God's love. I have two sons, and I would not sacrifice my son so that I could be friends to my enemies. That, that is not normal. That is not natural. But that's exactly what God did. We are the offenders. We are the wrongdoers. We are the criminals. We are the ones who have violated God's law and, and have deeply offended him by our sin. And yet he gave up his own son to die so that we could be reconciled. What an amazing demonstration of love. It's the ultimate demonstration of love. That's why the song says, When I survey the wondrous cross... That's what makes it so wondrous. God's love poured out for you and me. This is the heart of God. Christ loves us first. And he demonstrated it in so many ways, but we just see a very small example of it <clears throat> in the first couple of verses of John 8. Let's look back at John 8 and we'll see the next thing. Loves us first. Secondly, we see that Christ loves the guilty. Verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. It was, she was interrupted. She was discovered in her sin. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. There is not just a suspicion, not just some, some damning evidence. It was, she was observed. She was seen to be engaging in this sin, the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? <clears throat> and they had ulterior motives. Christ loves the guilty. And that includes this woman, that includes the Pharisees, that includes you and me. He loves the guilty. And what, what is a part of all of that? Well, we need to see that our sin makes us guilty. This woman was guilty of adultery. We don't see her trying to defend herself. There was no defense. And that's what you and I are before God. There is no defense. When you and I stand before God, hopefully, and I mentioned this earlier, it's much better to bow the knee before God now, before his holy his holiness now, than do it one day being compelled as lost people, compelled before the throne of God to bow the knee. But there's no defense for our sin. And those who do bow the knee one day in that way, they will, they will have not a word to say. Every mouth shall be stopped and all the world shall become guilty before God, the Bible says. God, God sees everything. He sees our heart. He sees our thoughts. He sees what we do when no one else is around. Our guilt is well established. There's no defense. There's no dispute. And this woman didn't try to defend herself. She didn't try to explain it away. We are just as guilty as she is. We have been seen and, and, and noticed by God in the very act of our sin. The Bible is very clear that we are all guilty and it's our sin that makes us such. If Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I may not know you. There, we have some visitors here. I don't know anything about you. I don't know your personal lives at all. But I do know you're guilty because the Bible says you are. And, and you know that I'm guilty because the Bible says I am. We all are. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There is no one that has not broken God's law. Christ is the only man, the only human that walked the earth. He, wa he is God in the flesh. He has not violated God's law. But he is the only one that has not. All of us are sinners. Look at Romans chapter 3 and we'll see a very unflattering description of sinners but it's very true and it's good for us to apply it to ourselves we often like to 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 um to explain away and justify and minimize our sin yeah i mean i made some mistake i know i'm not perfect yeah you know i've got this other thing that i've done but i'm i'm really not that bad i'm not like that person over there well how does god see us how does god see our guilt 
This is how he sees it. Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Before we knew about God, before we sought God, if you're saved before you were saved, this is you. We did not understand. We did not seek after God. We are all gone out of the way. We are together unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. A sepulcher is a burying place. A sepulcher, and we don't have them now. We, we put corpses in caskets and bury them in the ground. But they would have sepulchers where they would, there'd be rooms dug out of the ground and they would place these bodies. And if you went into one of those places after the bodies had been there a while, it would smell pretty bad. Their throat is, is corrupt and vile like that. This is what comes out of their mouth. This is the kind of speech that comes out of sinners. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. This is, this, these are our words. We violate God's law with our words. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Violence and wickedness in our deeds. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These are all ways in which we are guilty. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That's you and me. We are under the law. We are accountable to the law. God's law applies to us. God's law demands something of us. And this is what it does for us. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Children can be this way. You confront them about their wrongdoing. Oh, well, I didn't. And excuses just come pouring out. Explanations. I didn't really do it. I was doing this instead. I didn't know about it. I wasn't trying to. I stopped right away. All kinds of excuses. And trying to avoid guilt. Trying to avoid punishment. But when you and I stand before God, if you're lost, there will be nothing that you can say. There is no excuse. There is no justification. There is no defense. And criminal, criminal court you know, cases... They make a defense. They try to avoid it. And maybe sometimes they're, they're wrongfully accused. But you and I, before God, are not wrongfully accused. And there will be no point in making a defense. There is no defense to be made. I'm guilty. We'll just say it up front. If you're lost and you stand before God, you can either say it in this life or you can say it after this life. I'm guilty. But that is the right answer to God. How much better to do it in this life to say it willingly? rather than be compelled to say it after you have refused in this life. But one day you will say it. If you haven't already, you will stand before God and say, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. Your mouth will be stopped. Because God is right. He is righteous. And we are guilty. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Are you guilty today? How do you see yourself? Are you guilty? I don't mean guilty of mistakes. Oops, I'll try harder next time. I didn't mean that. I was trying to do the right thing and accidentally... I don't mean that. I'm not talking about that. You are guilty of that. I, I know that because you're like me. I'm talking about how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as guilty of wicked, vile sin before a holy God? Do you see yourself as deserving of eternal judgment? Do you see your sin as being wicked enough to put Christ on the cross all by yourself? Our sin didn't need to be pooled and combined with everybody else's sin to finally warrant Christ's sacrifice on the cross. You know, you and I, we could sin once or twice, and that's, gosh, oh yeah, I'll just explain that away. Over, I'll overlook that, slap on the wrist, and you can go free. But, you know, all these sins, okay, I guess we need the Son of God to pay for them. That's not how it works. You and I, one sin is enough. One sin deserves eternal damnation. One sin deserves punishment, and only Christ's shed blood 
can cleanse us and justify us. We are guilty. People often say, well, yeah, I mean, I've made mistakes. No one is perfect. And we're, we're just minimizing our guilt. That's not a meaningful admission of guilt. Well, yeah, I've done it. I mean, no one's perfect. I'm talking about something like what Simon Peter said. They were out all night fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And the Lord got in the boat and said, push out from land, let's go fishing. And Peter said, we've been fishing all night, we didn't catch anything. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will, we will let down the net. So they threw the net overboard to catch some fish, and immediately the, the, the net was full of fish. And they started pulling the net in, and it started to break, because there were so many fish. And Peter realized, this is the Son of God standing here. This is not just a good teacher, not just a good man. This is God in the flesh. And his response was... Right there in the boat, he fell down at Jesus' feet, knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Jesus wasn't saying anything about sin. They were fishing. And Peter saw the Lord lifted up. This is God. And he saw himself, and he fell down at his knees. I'm talking about that kind of guilt. Do you see yourself that way? I hope so. If you can see your guilt as God sees it, you are a major step closer to receiving his grace. Because as long as you try to diminish it and explain it away, you're not going to want or need Christ to save you. Look at Psalm 51. No excuses. We like to give ourselves a free pass. And we judge others' actions, but then we turn around and judge our own intentions. Look at what that person did. Can you believe it? What a dirtbag. But I just made a mistake. I intended to do this good thing. It's not, what, it's not the real me. I hear that all the time. You see that in the news. So-and-so is caught in a lie or caught in a, in, in a wicked scenario, some sort of uh, scandal, and they say, oh, you know, I'm sorry for that, but that's not the real me. You ever heard that? That's not my heart. I made a mistake. I just got carried away. It's not that big. I, I'm not going to do it again because it's not the real me. Yes, it is the real you. Yes, it is the real me because we are sinners. We're guilty. That's what God sees. King David, he was a man after God's own heart. And he committed a wicked, filthy, vile sin. He took a man's wife, and he arranged for that man essentially to be murdered on the battlefield. And God confronted him through Nathan the prophet. And David responded and said, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't say, well, that's not what I, I mean, God sees my heart. He knows, that's not the real me. He didn't say any of that. And this is the psalm that he wrote called David's penitential psalm. It's been called that. And in this psalm, we find a good example of seeing our guilt like God sees it. Let's look at verse 1 of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. Mercy means you don't deserve it. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. There is no defense. He is not defending anything. He is asking, begging God for mercy. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. My sin against thee and thee only. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And we could go on. But he's saying, it was my transgression. I did this. It's my sin. And I've been a sinner since the beginning. In sin, I was shapen in iniquity. This isn't just a, a, a lapse of judgment. This is who I am. It goes far beneath the surface. This is me, God, and I'm begging for your mercy. Do you see yourself that way? 
Well, that's, that's not really me. I mean, look at that. Other, that's our response. We start pointing fingers and deflecting because we don't want to deal with our guilt. But that's what we are. We are guilty. But I have good news for you. Christ loves the guilty. He sees exactly the extent of your guilt and he loves you in spite of it. He doesn't just accept you the way you are. He loves you in spite of the way you are. I'm so thankful that he loves the guilty. Let's look back at John chapter 8. We'll see another example of guilt. Another example of sin. This woman was taken in the very act. She was guilty. And Christ loves her. He still loves her. He loved her in this passage. He still loves her. John 8 verse 6. Look at, look at this other attitude that's represented here. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. It is a wicked attitude. We are right for pointing out the sin in, this, in these Pharisees' hearts. This is a wicked attitude. They didn't bring this woman to Christ saying, God, Lord, Rabbi, we found this woman in sin and this is distressing to us. This is very, this is sad. This is terrible. Why could she be doing this? This is wrong. What do you think we should do? We don't want to stone her, but that's what the law of Moses commands. Is this really what we should do? They weren't distressed about it. They were using her to try to find a way to accuse him. They hated him and they thought, ha ha, this is a good opportunity. We'll use her sin as a, as a tool to try to find a way to accuse him and, and, and undermine him and discard whatever he has to say. They were using her as an attack against him. Why? Because they were self-righteous. Our sin makes us guilty. And we see in, this Pharisee, in, the, in the lives of these Pharisees Self-righteousness. And it's important for us to note, because I've just spent a few minutes talking about our guilt and how we need to admit it. Why don't we admit it? Because we think we're self-righteous. We're, we're righteous. We have self-righteousness. And we need to understand that self-righteousness will put us in hell. Pharise these Pharisees did not want to listen to what Christ had to say because they were assured of their own righteousness. They were not interested in upholding God's law. That's not why they brought this woman here. They were not desiring for Christ to teach them. They did not care for this woman or for having a pure nation of people who worshipped God. That was not their reason, their purpose. Their purpose was to use this woman's sin to hopefully give them a chance to accuse and condemn Christ. And it seemed like the perfect setup. Because if Christ said, should we stone, if he, they, they were asking, the law of Moses says we should stone her, so should we do that? What do you say? If, if Christ said no, then they could accuse him of violating the law. You shouldn't listen to this guy. He said we shouldn't follow the law of Moses. If he said yes, then they could claim that he agreed with them and supported them. See, he's just like us. We, we were going to stone her, and he said she sh we should stone her, so we're... He follows after us. He listens to us. It seemed like the perfect setup. They were self-righteous, and that led to their using this woman for their own wicked plans. We can look in Luke chapter 18, and we can see how Pharisees were known for being self-righteous. In Luke 18, Jesus told a parable demonstrating the self-righteousness of Pharisees, and this man stands up in the temple and prays with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust. I am righteous. I do all these things. Pharisees were known for being that way. Turn to Matthew chapter 23, and we see Jesus excoriating the, the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verse 23. Just a small example of what he said to them. Verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. You're very careful in these spices and these small tithes but you're omitting mercy, judgment, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. 
figuratively showing how they were so detailed about little unimportant things and completely blind and, and ignoring the major things. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You're all about the surface, what people see of you. You're not worried about your heart before God. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse that which is first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity, because they did not see themselves as guilty. They were self-righteous. Woe unto you. Uh, verse 30, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, ye, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. They outdid their fathers because they killed the very Son of God. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Self-righteousness will put you in hell doesn't matter how righteous you look to me. It doesn't matter how righteous you seem to yourself or the world around you. What does God see in your heart? Don't, you don't need to defend yourself to me. I'm not your judge. I'm not going to condemn you in the sense of putting you in hell. I, I can't, I don't have that power. God's the judge. He's the one who will pronounce judgment and the sentence and carry it out. He sees us all as guilty. Will we see ourselves that way? Will we be honest? Look at Romans chapter 10, and we see this self-righteousness, this sentence of it, this, this um, diagnosis of it being more broad than just the Pharisees. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. The Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Israel is God's chosen people, but they were not saved. Paul is talking about lost Jews. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They, they, they are zealous for God, but it's not according to truth. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I made an emphasis on the word self-righteousness. You and I can be righteous. We can be truly righteous before God. And what a wonderful, blessed state that is. But if we are righteous before God, it will not be self-righteousness because you and I don't have any of it in ourselves. We cannot make any righteousness. We cannot create it. We cannot reach God's. It is God's righteousness. Other than that, there is no righteousness. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you insist that you are self-righteous, that you are a good person, you are telling God that you're righteous on your own. You don't need his righteousness. And that will put you in hell. These Jews had a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. They were going about to establish their own righteousness, and they did not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. That perfectly describes what we see in our world today. Self-righteousness. But it's, it's a paradox, because there is no righteousness in ourselves. If you are self-righteous, you are looking to justify yourself and condemn Christ, just like these Pharisees were. Philippians 3, 9, Paul says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. If you and I are going to be righteous, it has to be through keeping the law perfectly. That's righteousness. If it were possible for us to do that, we, would be, we could be righteous. But we've all already broken the law of God. In, in our hearts, in our actions, in our words... You go through the Ten Commandments. We, we break them routinely. We're not righteous, and it's impossible for us to be righteous. David admitted that. He acknowledged that. 
And that's the only way for us to be righteous, except for Christ. You need to call on him in faith and repentance. Let go of your self-righteousness. Because self-righteous people put themselves in hell, in judgment. I'm so glad that Christ loves us first. I'm so glad that he loves the guilty. Let's look back at John chapter 8, and we'll see the next thing about the heart of God that's revealed in this passage. John 8, verse 6. Jesus stooped down and wrote with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Verse 7, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. We're not told some things in this passage. We're not told what he was writing. We're not told why he was writing. We're not told, some, some people speculate about what he wrote. But what we do see is that the Pharisees were convicted. And they knew that there was sin in their heart. When Jesus said this, oh, he that is without sin among you. I, I'm not disputing what the law of Moses says, but the first person to cast a stone, let him be one without sin. And that was exactly what those men needed to reveal to them their self-righteousness, their, 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 their wicked attitude. She's a sinner. We're not. We should judge her. And this man, Jesus, too, because we're finding a way to accuse him. They were convicted by their own conscience, and they walked out. Thirdly, we see that Christ came to save all sinners. Whether it's a woman like this adulterous woman who was caught in the very act or the self-righteous Pharisees, Christ came to save all sinners. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, we read a list of terrible wicked sins. Paul says, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he starts to just give a list of, of, of heinous crimes and sins. Christ came to save people from that. Because he says, such were some of you. You used to be that. And now you've been saved. I'm so thankful that Christ came to save all sinners. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 say, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, as if that isn't bad enough, etc. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we read a list like this and we might say, that's right, God, those people need to be judged. They deserve judgment. They need to be saved. You, you, you save those kinds of people. People like this adulterous woman. But Jesus didn't confront the adulterous woman about her sin. He confronted the self-righteous religious crowd because he came to save all sinners. This woman wasn't offering a, a defense. She knew she was guilty. These self-righteous Pharisees were the ones who were trying to posture themselves as, as good. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee before he was a, a saint, a child of God. And he calls himself, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Are you a sinner like this woman? Are you guilty? You might be self-righteous today, but Christ came to save you. Maybe you've lived a, 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 a terrible life of, of crime and immorality and lying. I mean, maybe you've done all of that. Christ came to save you. Maybe you've grown up in church all your life and you're, you just look like you've got it together. Everybody looks up to you and thinks you're just so, so refined and so, so polished. Christ came to save you too. Everyone in between. He came for the Pharisees. He came for this woman. 
He came for somebody like Zacchaeus. He came for someone like the Apostle Paul. He came for someone like Ethan Custer and for someone like you, all sinners. But you have to see yourself as guilty. Christ came to save all sinners. And lastly, Christ delights in mercy. He delights in it. That was why David received forgiveness. His penitential psalm, he didn't deserve forgiveness, and neither do we. But God delights in mercy. He didn't deserve mercy, and neither do we. John 8, verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. In Matthew 9, 13, Jesus says, Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We see the heart of God in these verses. And it's not because God was overlooking and excusing and ignoring this woman's sin. He asked her a question. Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man. He did not diminish her sin. He did not say, you know, I know you didn't mean it. I know that you grew up in a, in a difficult home situation, and that's what led you to this. You're not really to blame for that. I know that you didn't really want to end up here, and so it's not a big deal. Don't beat yourself up about it. He didn't say any of that. He didn't try to diminish her sin in the slightest. In fact, he highlights the fact that every person is a sinner. We want to, to highlight other people's sin because it makes us feel better about ourselves. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, this woman's sin was horrible, but so is yours and so is mine. Yes, this woman's sin is heinous, but you know what? I've committed heinous crimes too. Yes, it's terrible when somebody murders another person, but you know what Jesus said? If you hate someone in your heart, you've murdered them in your heart. Yes, adultery is wicked and horrible, but you know what? When you lust after someone in your heart, you're committing that sin in your heart. All sin is wicked. And he did not diminish her sin. Instead, the Lord shows that all sinners deserve judgment. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. We agree that God should judge sinners. You know, those, those other people out there. God judge them. They're wicked. Well, when you are ready to declare that God should judge your sin, then you are ready to hear about God's mercy. Do you think God should judge your sin? We should think that, because it's what we deserve. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Now, why would, why would he say this? I mentioned earlier, God does not accept us just as we are. And that is, not being, that is not happening when he says that. Neither do I condemn thee. You're fine. I accept you. You're good to go. He did not diminish or ignore or explain away her sin. In fact, he acknowledges that it was sin because he says, go and sin no more. Your sin is not okay, which is why you should stop it. It's not fine. It's not okay. It's not being overlooked. Don't do it anymore. Christ is not happy with you and me as we are. He doesn't just accept us just as we are. It's no big deal. I understand. He's not tolerant of us in our sin as we are. He does not accept us just the way we are, but he loves us just the way we are. He is not fine with us remaining just the way we are. That's why he delights in mercy, because he is not tolerant of who we are as we are. He has to give mercy because we're not okay. He loves us just as we are, but he does not accept us. He wants us to change. He wants us to be justified. He wants us to be cleansed. Go and sin no more because you're not fine just the way you are. 
You need a savior. You need cleansing. For God so loved the world, John 3.16 says, that he gave his only begotten son. If we were fine just the way we are, he didn't need to give his son. But he loves us enough to save us because we're not fine. And so he gave his son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why Christ came to earth, to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why Christ didn't come to condemn, because we're already condemned. Christ's ministry was not here on the earth to condemn people. Oh, you're a sinner, you're condemned. You're a sinner, you're condemned. He doesn't have to condemn us because we're already condemned. Our sinfulness before God is already condemning to us. We're already in, in, scheduled for God's judgment. That's what we deserve. He came to save us. He came to change us. He doesn't just accept us and, and is pleased with us just the way we are. He loves us. And he wants to change us. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He wants to change us from our selfish and sinful ways. That's why he told this woman, Go and sin no more. But he loves us enough to show us mercy so that we will voluntarily submit to being changed. I'm thankful that God does not condemn us as quickly as he has the right to do. He does not send us to hell as soon as he could. He gives us chances to know the truth and believe it. He is long-suffering. But if you reject his mercy, you will find that he does not accept you just the way you are. He can only accept you in the righteousness of Christ through the, through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Because... The Lord Jesus Christ paid for our sin. How could, but how could he say to her, go and sin no more? Wasn't she guilty? Wasn't the law of Moses clear about how to handle these kinds of people? Weren't the Pharisees proven correct? They had already left. They didn't hear his words to her. But he said, go and sin no more. I'm not going to condemn you. Wait, isn't that what they wanted to accuse him of? No, not quite. Christ is merciful, but Christ is not unjust. Because even while he is merciful to us, he is perfectly just in his treatment of sin. She said unto him, No man, Lord. She accepted him as her Savior. She believed on him from her heart. And when that happened, he said, I don't condemn you either. How could he say that? Because he came to shed his blood and pay for your sin and my sin so that we wouldn't need to be condemned. Jesus said in John 12, 47, If any man hear my words and believe, believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The word condemn means to pronounce sentence on. Christ was qualified to condemn her, but he chose not to because that's what the Savior does. The Savior saves people, who, those who believe on him. He is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ wasn't just slapping her on the wrist and sending her off to resume her sin if she wanted to. He wasn't siding with her against those pompous Pharisees. He wasn't showing a carelessness for sin. Instead, he was encouraging his new child, his brand new child, to go and live for him and not for herself. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Grace is what gives us eternal life. And God's grace is greater than all our sin. 
So, hey, grace is a good thing, so let's just sin some more so that we get more grace. No, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Into his death we are symbolizing this, this spiritual work, picturing that through the physical act of baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If you've been saved, walk like you're saved. Live in that newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's why Jesus said, go and sin no more. That was your old life. You were caught in that sin. You're guilty. You're not defending it. You knew your own guilt. You've seen me. You've acknowledged me as Lord. You've been saved. Now go and don't live like that anymore. I don't want you to be that way. I love you the way that you have been, the way that you are, the light, even in the life that you lived. I've always loved you, but I don't want you to live that way anymore. You're my child now. That's what happens at salvation. God doesn't just accept us and say, hey, I'm just thankful that you like me, so it's fine. You know, make your own best choice. Do the best you can. Sin or not, you know, I love you anyway. It's okay. I'll tolerate it. That's not how God looks at it. We need his mercy because we're guilty. And once we're saved, Christ says, don't live that way anymore. Live in a way that glorifies me. Live in a way that lifts me up. I don't want you to be that anyway, anymore. You, you be like me. But no matter how we live, Christ still loves us. In John 8, we see the heart of God. His law is still righteous and holy. But if he carried out his judgment on us as soon as we deserved it, there would be no way for us to be saved. We all deserve judgment. We're all guilty, but Christ loves the guilty in spite of our sin. He loved us first seeking us when we wanted nothing to do with him. Yet we lift ourselves up in self-righteousness, denying the true depth of our guilt and wickedness. The heart of God loves all sinners and sent Christ to die and save every single one. He delights in mercy and grace and gives us many chances to accept it. If we insist on being judged by the law, we will be. But Christ desires to pay for our sins himself so that we can have his righteousness. So I ask you, will you admit your guilt and come to Christ? Will you accept his mercy and his payment for your sin? Will you let him have your life so that you can go out and live for him? That's what the heart of God desires for you. And we ought to desire that as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us. We don't deserve it. We're not worthy of it. We can never earn it. And we don't understand it, but we're so thankful for it. But we need to see ourselves as we really are, the way you see us, and we need to admit it. And we just need to throw ourselves upon your mercy and trust in your grace. You're not going to justify our actions. You're not going to explain them away or ignore them. We are accountable. Every one of us shall give account of ourselves to God. But in Christ, we may have mercy. And so I pray that you would help us to throw ourselves on that mercy and be saved. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?